Okay. Deafening silence. So, <laughs> no, no. Okay, we can start as you want. Yes, we are in time. Hello, everybody. My name is Alejandro Esteves, and I am the director of CDO of the University of Buenos Aires. I wish to welcome everybody to our public policy in context cycle. Our today's webinar is about ambiguity and cross-national responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our speaker is Nicolaus Zachariadis. He has a PhD in political science from University of Georgia. Also, he holds a Marty Bockman Chair and Professor of International Studies at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee, USA. He's co-editor of International Review of Public Policy, Vice, Fulbright Scholar, and Trice, President of International Studies Association South. And for the comments, we have Mariana Beatriz Noé. She's a postdoctoral fellow in philosophy in ancient political philosophy from Columbia University. She holds a PhD in classical study from Columbia University and she has a bachelor degree in philosophy from the University of Buenos Aires. So let's start our conference of today. Please, Nicolás, you have uh, almost 30 minutes. Eh? 40 minutes if you want, 35, 40, it doesn't matter. We are going to hear you anyway. And after that, Mariana will make some comments to your exposition. So let's start and welcome, dear Nicolas, welcome, dear Mariana. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alejandro and everybody else for inviting me uh, to this uh, lecture and, and for giving me the opportunity to share my opinion. Uh, with you guys on some research that, that uh, I have done relatively recently and uh, continue to do, actually. Um, it is on a uh, public policy um, framework that, that I uh, have helped uh, develop um, for many years now. Um, and I've applied it with, with colleagues to um, a uh, COVID-19, something that, you know, all of you guys uh, know. Unfortunately, we've all been through it and are still through it, regardless of what the media um, tell us. Um, it's still around us. So we all need to be careful. That's my... Um, word of wisdom for the day. If you remember nothing else, just, just be careful, please. Um, and so what I'm going to do is share my thoughts for about 37 minutes. I'll split the difference um, um, for Alejandro's sake. Uh, and then uh, I am uh, happy to get Mariana's and Alejandro's comments. And of course, the, any questions uh, that you may have, I'm, I'm more than uh, glad to, to hear them. Again, I am happy to be here. I wish it were in person, to be honest with you. I'd love to uh, come to Buenos Aires. It's, um, it's not a place uh, that I have been. I haven't been to Argentina at all. I, I only know the, the, the greatest football players that, that you guys seem to produce in abundance. Um, and, and that's it. Uh, and on that note, and on that note, it is not working. Ah, it is working. Um, why and how do countries respond differently to the same um, uh, pandemic, to the same crisis? So essentially, this is the, the research question. And what I'm going to try to do is answer this question uh, using several tools, the, the sort of the, the framework uh, 
that I will use the policy framework is the multiple streams framework, and I will use it as an organizing device. I'm not going to come up with hypotheses, although you can easily derive some from, from what you see, and maybe that will give you ideas for some of you at least. If you're working on your pop, uh, public policy um, um, works or and research that uh, you may find it inspirational, perhaps, and I'll be happy to, to talk more about that. Um, the MSF framework has um, several uh, components to it. Just a brief review. It has a policy window. It essentially says that there is a context within which choices take place that don't take place in a vacuum. And here in this particular case is the COVID-19 crisis. So you have a crisis hitting and therefore you've got to do something. There's a sense of urgency and it means that governments have to respond. You have a problem stream, which is essentially the cases, the number of cases that or and uh, or deaths. Um, the idea behind it is that there's something pointing attention to something amiss, something is happening, something that we don't want, something that is out of the ordinary. That's the whole point. And therefore, the government needs to respond somehow. Um, how does it respond? You have a policy stream um, where ideas are being formulated about what to do and how to do it, etc. All of these ideas depend on what I will call, and we'll, we'll talk about that later, policy capacity. Finally, you have a politics stream, which sort of enca encapsulates the, the broader concept of, of politics in a particular country, um, like in Argentina. Um, you have the issue of political leadership. Uh, leaders got to do something. They, they ha you have to have um, competent individuals who are willing to, to uh to take charge, you have to um, have the trust of the people who need to comply with whatever the leaders tell them um, what to do. And as we all know, um, our leadership has told us to do things that most of us were not terribly familiar with or eager to do or willing to do. Yet in some countries, it was easier than in others. Finally, you have institutional impediments. It will become very obvious as we start comparing uh, countries because what I'm going to do is compare different countries, four countries, and we will take a look at um, how it all takes place. So first, let me talk a little bit about each of those elements that I spoke to you in brief uh, separately, the policy window. Policy window is essentially uh, uh, the, the COVID-19 crisis, the pandemic. Um, so what is a crisis? Um, a crisis is a sudden temporary disturbance in the rhythm of social life. It's a rather fancy um, definition to, to say that a crisis is something urgent, something uh, that you don't understand, hence the ambiguity. And it is something that involves a whole lot of change from the normal way of doing things. Um, it can have, it, it, it is becomes a crisis. So not every crisis is a crisis, if, if, if that makes sense. It becomes a crisis either because it has um, adverse consequences or because government or we have uh, inadequate resources to deal with, with, with it. If we could deal with um, COVID-19 the same way we deal with, let's say, the flu, it would not have been a crisis because we're used to the flu. We know what it is. And therefore, it would not have been uh, anything uh, spectacular. It is possible that that's how it turns out at the end. That is, from now on, we treat it like something chronic that comes and goes every year, perhaps. Uh, and we just get uh, uh, inoculated, and that's all there is to it. Again, at the time when it hit in 2020, it was something unknown, and therefore it became a crisis. Now, crisis can be a natural disaster, such as Hurricane Katrina in the U.S., or floods, earthquakes, that sort of stuff. Or it could be a man-made issue, such as war, um, near war, like the Cuban Missile Crisis, where you, you, um, you have man-made situations, not necessarily having anything to do with uh, nature in general. Um, so you have the, the problem stream now. So a crisis hit, um, 
people take a look at it, and then you have to decide, well, is the pandemic a crisis? You know it's happening, and you have to decide, is it really a crisis? It's an outbreak of a disease, uh, but is, is it important? And we all know that at least in the beginning, we weren't exactly sure. Nobody was sure. Uh, what was going on. A pandemic, just for some definition's sake, is an outbreak of a disease that spreads over national borders. Otherwise, it's an epidemic, which is when it is contained within um, national borders. Pandemics are relatively common. That, that's what most people don't understand. Um, uh, and some are very lethal, actually, uh, but most are not. And I'll give you some examples of the more lethal and celebrated not so celebrated ones. There was a plague in the sixth century that most people don't know that killed about an estimated 30 to 50 million people. Um, in the 14th century, again, what we know as the Black Plague killed about 25 million people. The Spanish flu, for we all discovered it after uh, COVID hit because it was very similar to it of 1918. 50 million people, that's a whole lot of people that we know nothing about. It was a mega event. So there are pandemics that are relatively, uh, most of them are relatively harmless or at least non-lethal, uh, but some are. And diseases that affect the respiratory system are most contagious and therefore um, they are, we pay more attention to them. So the more contagious ones, we pay more attention to them, um, which makes COVID uh, very different from, let's say, the monkeypox uh, disease that, that seems to be spreading uh, right now that, that is far less contagious because it requires skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact, um, contact. It's a very different kind of uh, contagion issue. So pandemics create crises because of the need to respond. You have inadequate resources and therefore you got to do something and citizens turn to government for relief and safety. Now let's go to the policy stream. So what constitutes a policy response? I mean, you know, what do you do when something like that happens? Um, for those of you who are interested sort of in academic um, discourse, You've got to uh, look at policies in some kind of framework. Uh, it's a series of decisions, obviously. Any, any response is a series of decisions that you make that, at least in theory, ought to have some logic, some internal logic to them. You've got to do things that help you address issues that you want to address. Um, that's usually very difficult to sort of frame academically because they're not framed naturally. Government just does stuff. Um, and what I've decided to do with, with at least this pandemic is look at a um, definition and a framework that the U.S. Uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, uh, came up with a few years ago that says, well, in every crisis, you've got to have these kinds of issues addressed in their response. And the response includes coordination, essentially agency. You know, how do you do what you do? What kind of agencies do you pull up front? How do you coordinate between them? Because everything is sequential. I mean, you don't do everything at once. You've got to take, for example, first uh, protective measures before you go into treatment measures. So all of these things need to be um, addressed within your response. You've got to have a message. You've got to explain to people what is happening, why they're doing, or you ask them to do what you want them to do. And of course, you've got to have resources. The more resources, the better off you are. Uh, nothing speaks louder than money, unfortunately. And while it's not the only thing, it certainly makes life a lot easier to have an abundance of resources to deal with, with some of these issues. And putting all of this stuff together, 
Well, I came up, this is part of a broader uh, book, actually, um, that I co-authored with, uh, with, with colleagues, um, a broader range of responses that uh, has two edges. One is centralization, and the other one is decentralization. You can also have paralysis chaos, where you look at it and nothing happens. Um, but usually, more often than not, you have either a government that centralizes its response, you have a few people that is making all the decisions, taking charge, moving forward, or you have decentralization where you give information and you let people on the ground, agencies usually, not individuals, on the ground make some of those decisions. Let's now look at the pol political stream, which is the sort of the broader politics uh, that, that, um, that uh, within which these, de these decisions take place. Um, trust, you gotta have trust. Trust is the expectation that, that citizens have of government. They, they, we want government to do something and you trust the, the government in different ways. Um, I'll show you, for example, examples where you have some uh, countries where citizens have very high trust in their government and other countries where they don't have a high trust of their government. That is their ability, of, the ability of their government to protect them, to do the right thing, to help them address whatever issue that needs to be addressed. Now it's a perception, it's not a reality. And of course it changes over time. It's not necessarily that government does these things, but it is necessarily what citizens perceive government to be able to do. Um, so if capacity, recall, uh, we talked about policy capacity earlier on, constitutes the supply of what government can do, trust is the demand, what citizens expect it to do. If trust in government, trust in doctors, nurses, healthcare, um, et cetera. You also have within the political stream, um, institutional factors, and here I'm thinking of federal versus unitary systems. It makes a difference in your response, whether you have a federal or a unitary system, because it tells you whether you can centralize or decentralize decision making and at, what's, uh, in what, at what level these decisions uh, will take place. Um, and I'll talk about the U.S., for example, where President Trump found out the hard way he could make those decisions, even though he was blamed for everything that, that went on, he really uh, had very little, um, was able to do very little actually um, about it uh, other than coordinate, but we'll get to that. Um, so you have a difference between federal and unitary systems. What is political leadership? In my opinion, that's key to success. You gotta have good people in the right places so that they can make the right decisions. And it's the ability of individuals in authority to motivate groups to act and achieve certain goals. Um, leaders think, they frame, they persuade, they inspire, they do everything you expect them to do. And good leadership uh, is key um, to good politics. Now, in democratic systems, you have one more um, element that's very important, and that is you also have to have accountable leaders. I mean, leaders don't necessarily only do all of these things. They also have to be held accountable, and that's a tricky situation uh, in most cases, especially uh, during crises. But enough with the theory. Let's get to the fun stuff. How many millions of people died, uh, et cetera. Um, this is um, uh, current as of the end of July. So add a few uh, to the, the cases and the deaths that, um, that I have. 570 million cases. That's a boatload of people who have gotten infected. It's probably underreported, as, as, as we probably all understand. 6.338 million deaths, all of this is worldwide. That's, um, that's a lot. That's unacceptably high for a world that has the capacity. Uh, it may be unevenly distributed, 
but we do have the capacity. And in fact, what has happened is medically, at least, is miraculous when it comes to vaccinations, for example. Never before have vaccines been um, developed and gone into uh, widespread use as quickly and as effectively as they have. Um, and the, I give you some uh, estimates so that you have some idea of what's going on. The rates are 50% roughly uh, for the world, but this involves at least one case, uh, one dose. Um, as, and as we all know, in some instances, you need two doses. So it's essentially half for probably most of the vaccines, but not all the vaccines require uh, two doses. Um, fully vaccinated, uh, what governments we, uh, report, and again, all of that is tricky. Um, you have the UAE with 88%, Portugal 86%, Cuba 62 That's That's a whole lot uh, for some countries at least. And interestingly enough, in these countries, we expect the death rates to go down. And if they don't, we need to ask, well, why is that happening? And this is what I'm going to do right now. First, let's talk about the first country that um, experienced COVID, uh, China. I give you the number of cases and the death um, estimates and the vaccination per 100 people. Um, don't mind what I'm saying. I can um, decipher my um, abbreviations. Uh, C stands for cases. Deaths is 5.44 million. Deaths are 5.226. Uh, See how accurate I am, my God. A uh, thousand. Um, so it's it's a very minor uh, number of deaths. Vaccination per hundred people you have in cases, thirty nine percent, and that we are aware of of the population. And deaths are a minor, minor, minor point zero 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 four percent. So really. The takeaway from all of this is the Chinese may have been the first one to have experienced um, COVID, but they have handled it relatively effectively with very few deaths. And let's figure out what exactly happened. We have early December cases, December of 2019 now. We transport ourselves back to 2019. Um, they're alerted by the 30th of December by a doctor who has been vilified in the media and by the government. And it is only when the WHO gets involved uh, that we, we find out, the rest of us find out about what is actually going on in China. So the Chinese government knew about COVID, but essentially they did nothing about it. And they did nothing for about a month until the, 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 uh, the Chinese uh, Communist Party decided to, to make an announcement that indeed something unusual is happening and we need to do something about. So the question of course is, um, why would you wanna do that? And the answer is uh, twofold. Uh, number one, they did it because um, the Chinese party is infallible. Essentially the, the, the communists uh, rule on the basis that we know everything, we take care of everything and don't worry about it. Therefore, put up and shut up. Hence, essentially, they're, they're able to control, uh, you know, a billion and a half people uh, that way. But the second and equally important thing is precisely because this is the social contract, so to speak, they've got to deliver on their promise. And deliver, I mean, deliver the good life, uh, deliver a high, relatively high and increasing standard of living, deliver that is the easy life to the extent possible. If they appear weak, and if they appear as if they don't know what is going on, which is precisely what was happening at the time, then they appear as if they are breaking that and they're inviting, breaking the contract, and they're inviting dissent. And therefore, they would rather let people die than invite dissent. It's, it's good old fashioned uh, communism at its best. It's only after they actually deciphered uh, the genome of the actual virus. They knew what was going on. Not only did they know about the virus, they, they already knew what the, what the sequence, the genetic sequence uh, 
was of the virus. Only then did they make it uh, 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 known that indeed such a virus is there. And of course, by that time, it had spread uh, throughout because it was highly uh, contagious. Then they engaged in what can only be described as bravado, essentially huge demonstrations of power. As some of you may remember, they build a hospital in seven days and how exciting and look at how uh, capable we are and what we can do. Uh, but none of that really mattered because the disease was, uh, was already spreading um, and it ha had already spread. So essentially what the Chinese did was initially they allowed it to, they let it go for political reasons. Then they pulled back but they installed draconian measures. We all know, at least in the first um, uh, wave and now in the second wave, they've isolated entire regions and, and cities uh, in order to have zero cases. They haven't achieved that yet, uh, but, but it's an incredible uh, feat um, with a population that unbelievably is starting to complain about it. And you know, to complain in China, that's a criminal offense. So when you hear these things, I mean, you know there is considerable tension underneath. Um, so vaccination rate is very good, but we don't know how effective the vaccines are because they've all been vaccinated with the Chinese vaccines and we haven't been able to, to see the results and replicate their results. They don't make this information available. Um, so now take this and let's start comparing different countries. We'll go to the other extreme, a very small country like Greece. Um, cases of 4.12 million, deaths 30,000, vaccination rate of 73%. All of these are one um, dose. 39% um, uh, cases per uh, 100 uh, people. Deaths are 0.3, obviously much higher than what the Chinese um, have experienced. You know, how have the Greeks handled the situation? Um, they have handled it reasonably well, at least initially. Uh, they have used a very highly centralized, I mean, think about China centralized and you expect that to be. Greece was very, very highly centralized, essentially a small group around the prime minister made all the decisions. And it was primarily uh, worked within the civil protection uh, agency, not the health ministry. So the health ministry, not that they were peripheral, but they were not at the center of it all. It was civil protection, essentially people who deal with uh, disaster management. Um, the reason why they did it so effectively, at least initially, was because they were horrified in the Italian case uh, at the time. Um, what was going on in Italy, we're talking about early March now of 2020, was horrific scenes of people dying in, um, in hospitals. And therefore, um, they showed that on TV. And that scared the daylights out of everybody. Partly because they also realized the, the healthcare system was so weak, nothing like the Italian system. So if the Italians are experiencing this kind of situation, the Greeks understood it, they would have an even more horrible situation and therefore they needed to crack down as early as possible. They took protective measures, lockdowns and all the other good stuff that nobody liked, but found um, important. So everything shut down. Unfortunately, that also had the, what we of course know now, the, um, the, the tourist effect or, or the economic slowdown effect. Uh, the country paid for it very dearly. And the only reason why they haven't um, uh, faced um, the, the Piper yet is primarily because they uh, borrowed money. Uh, some of it was borrowed internally. Most of it was from European funds. Other countries did the same thing. I'm not saying it was only Greece, but that's the only way that they were able to, uh, to sustain essentially the economy so that nobody uh, closes shop and goes home and sort of everything collapses. Part of the problem, of course, is um, the bill hasn't come yet. 
So when everybody sees the bill, it's not going to be a pleasant situation. But we'll get to that point when we get to that point. Uh, there have been five waves. Essentially, these things come in waves, as we all know. Five waves already. Two lockdowns. In some cases, they've taken regional measures. Part of the problem that they've uh, found out is that centralization does not work very well. If you have different regions of the country experiencing it in different ways, and therefore one size doesn't fit all. Part of the problem that the Greeks faced is they don't have capacity. They don't have regional capacity. They, they only have centralized government capacity. And therefore, the, the prime minister was complaining that the regions are not doing their part. The problem is they couldn't, even if they, if they wanted to, they just didn't have the capacity. They couldn't essentially monitor the disease the way they, the, they should. Uh, because they didn't have the tools to do so. Um, there, eventually, you started having compliance issues with so many waves. You, you're starting to have people who just don't care anymore. And you have lockdown fatigue. Uh, and the aims uh, have been primarily to prevent the health system from collapsing. And the economy has taken a big hit because of it. Not recently, they've actually let it uh, go. I was there this summer, and one of the issues that I noticed was there was an uptick in cases, but they're not being reported. Greece is not the only uh, country I know. It's just so you have um, considerable under-reporting now, perhaps, and I don't know that, that's my speculation, perhaps because nobody wants to deal with it anymore. Everybody's sick of it. Now let's look at another country that has done something completely different. So you're going from a highly centralized response to a highly decentralized response. Um, Sweden, uh, which may be an unusual exception, um, you, is about roughly the size of Greece population-wise, even though it's a much bigger country. Um, same urban density, these things do make a difference. Uh, and you have reasonably the same number of cases, but you have very much fewer uh, deaths. The, so the death rate is significantly lower. The vaccination rate is roughly um, the same. So the question then becomes, well, how did they do it and what did, did they do? What you do have in Sweden, unlike in Greece, which may be the closest um, uh, comparable case, is very high quality healthcare. And therefore they relied on their ability to also treat cases in ways that the Greeks could not. So you take not only preventive measures, but you also are capable of dealing with the, with the most difficult uh, uh, cases. But they also have a very high sense of individual and social responsibility, high trust, if you'd like, in their government. Unlike the Greeks who have extremely low trust, they may be closer to what Argentinians are, I would imagine, when it comes to their own government than the Swedes are. Um, Essentially, uh, what, what the Swedes did was um, allow people, tell them, don't congregate, be responsible, uh, but you don't have to wear masks, which is highly unusual, especially in Greece, you know, and other places, uh, even in, in, um, in the U.S. or, or uh, China, where masks, at least for a while, were mandatory. Um, in Sweden, they were never mandatory. Uh, you were supposed to keep uh, social distancing, but all of that was on a voluntary basis. And many people, I'm not going to say all, actually abide by it, um, complied with, with the request. And the requests were made not by politicians, which was very unusual, but by civil protection again and the health agencies. So it's essentially bureaucrats spearheading the process, even though eventually... It's, it's all a political uh, game. If the politicians disagree, trust me, they'll intervene. Uh, but there is a reason, sort of a blame avoidance reasons, the good old fashioned uh, public policy stuff uh, that enables the politicians to, to step back and let the bureaucrats take the fall if things go badly. At the end of the day, they will also take the credit when it comes to elections. I can assure you they will, regardless of whether they deserve it or not. The economy stayed open, which is very unusual. 
And even though there was debate, I mean, I'm not going to say that, you know, everybody was happy. Not, not everybody has been happy about how they responded. It has been relatively successful, heavily decentralized, exact opposite of what you think of centralization, very consistent message, and quite a few resources. And let's now get to the U.S. case, uh, because I know it, believe it or not, a little bit better because I live here. Um, number of cases is probably the highest in the world, 90.2 million, 1.2. We've surpassed the million marker uh, of deaths, which in my opinion is absolutely inexcusable. But nevertheless, here we are. Uh, relatively high death and case uh, ratio. Again, for a country that prides itself as being as having very high, uh, high quality healthcare, which is absolutely true, but it's not terribly accessible, and and that's that's an issue that uh, that we can discuss later on. So, what has happened? Um, it has high capacity in the sense that it's got all the agencies that it needs to. It's got resources. It's got expertise. I mean, everything is there for the system to work well. Um, however, the problem was exclusively political. We're talking now about 2020. It was the last year of the Trump administration. And you had a very politically motivated response. Essentially, what he was telling us was, don't worry, be happy by the summer. It will dissipate like the flu does, magically. It's all magic. Well, magic didn't come, unfortunately. And therefore, um, the, the, the message was not consistent. We were getting different um, um, messages from different people. You have the CDC, which only issues guidelines. Um, they're essentially the health bureaucrats uh, who suggest what we should do, but they can't do anything about it. It's a government agency, but not really. So it's the government that has to do something. And here comes federalism, and that's why it's very important. The federal government cannot really issue anything. It's actually the state governors who have the authority to shut down the economy. Because of federalism, it's the state governors that could have essentially said, we impose a lockdown, everybody wears masks, the end. They didn't for political reasons that passed the buck down to local governments. So you had a patchwork of local governments who now had to deal with those decisions. You know, how do you deal with COVID? Some of them made masks mandatory, some of them didn't. Some of them shut down restaurants, others didn't. Then they, some of them reopened them, others didn't. So it's really a patchwork that ended up being quite chaotic. The reason why it was not as effective, more, it was not just, it was not just decentralized, it was paralysis, it was chaos, at least initially. The reason was essentially political. There was the presidential election coming, and therefore President Trump knew, and he was right about that, that um, if the economy goes down, so does my reelection, which is exactly what happened. Uh, thankfully, I might add. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, we have a new uh, president uh, who puts all his eggs in the vaccination basket. Essentially, President Biden, when he came in, made vaccinations available, widely available. I mean, I was surprised. Uh, and now they are so incredibly available. I don't understand what is happening. If you want a, a fourth dose or a third dose or whatever, you can go get it. I mean, you don't have to make an appointment. You don't have to do anything. Go to the neighborhood drugstore. I want something. Boof. There you go. Uh, which is unusual. I find it highly unusual. Um, but but that's what it is. They're, they're very highly available. Yet it does have the country does have a relatively low vaccination rate and um, um, relatively high death rate. So the question then becomes, well, why is that the case? I mean, what has been sort of what has gone wrong? There are two issues that are throughout uh, the world, but especially true in the US. The first one is past the 70% rate, you end up hitting sort of a wall. And the wall is that 30 to 40% of the population 
who are the naysayers, the conspiracy theorists, the it's all a hoax, the I am too busy, I don't have the time to do anything, the I don't know, I don't care, the what is COVID, all of those individuals that have to be convinced and for some reason are not. And therefore, you've got to deal with um, essentially them. And for the most part, they're the ones who contribute to a high death and uh, uh, the case uh, rate. Uh, and the hospitalization rate, I didn't uh, mention that, but essentially those who go to the hospital, at least a percentage of them, end up being non-vaccinated and a higher percentage of them ends up dying. Um, so that's an issue, but that's a political social issue that's very difficult to solve, yet the politicians in power will have to pay the price. Welcome to democracy. It's, it's not fair, but that's how it is. Um, the other issue, at least in the U.S., is the inaccessibility of the health system. That is, you have a good health system, but in many instances, it's not accessible. So some of the population that you see in, as having died has certain characteristics. And other than the usual stuff that you can't do anything about, age, for example, um, you also have things like um, poverty. It has hit poor people. Uh, much more than it has hit non-poor people. And with poverty come all sorts of other issues such as it has racial characteristics because more non-whites are poor in this country and therefore more of them have experienced death rates, higher death rates uh, than, than, than others. So it's got social uh, and political dimensions that, that are very important not to be forgotten. And I am sure as we're moving into treatments now, um, they will become uh, essential because treatments are still very expensive. And of course, because of that, they are also inaccessible or unevenly accessible, I should say. And therefore probably the issues will persist. So let's pull everything together and conclude with a bang. Does the multiple streams framework apply? Remember that I, I used it as an organizational uh, instrument. The answer is yes. Uh, and we can go into more detail if you want sort of the more academic version of all of this stuff, I'm happy to, to comply. Uh, but some of the more interesting, at least in my opinion, content wise uh, issues, is there a best way to respond? The answer is no. Uh, different uh, strokes for different folks, so the argument goes, meaning that different countries respond differently because they have different capacities, different uh, uh, trust, and therefore the, the citizens expect them to do things um, differently. Uh, for example, would the Swedish respond response work in Greece? Absolutely not. I can guarantee you, absolutely not. It would have been chaos. Um, and vice versa, would the Greek response work in Sweden? Absolutely not. They wouldn't take it. They would simply not accept somebody beating down uh, uh, the door saying, you got to do this, comply or else. Um, are democracies better at responding? That's a very interesting question because it appears, at least in terms of effectiveness, democracies are not as easy to respond. They're messy. We have to decide, we have to agree, we have to hold our leaders accountable. We want them to be accountable. And, and that means that in cases where you have urgency, then you don't make the decisions that you probably should or perhaps should uh, at the right time, which means that you're going to have more collateral damage, so to speak, than otherwise would have been the case. Look at the case of China. On the other hand, in China and places like China, Singapore, there's all sorts of other places, even though China may be extreme, um, you had measures taken that we would not accept in most democratic countries. And so there is a trade-off between effectiveness and accountability. I mean, we want our leaders to be effective. We want to be protected. But at the other hand, there is a red line, so to speak, and that may differ from country to country, but certainly differs from democracies uh, to non-democracies. All of this rests on political leadership. 
And I cannot emphasize how important it is in questions of uh, disaster response or pandemic response or crisis response. Um, you essentially get the leaders that you vote for. Uh, so if you don't care, you don't vote for the right people, if you think they're all crooks, well, don't be surprised if you get crooks uh, as leaders and, and, and vice versa. So it's important to have the right people who will do the right thing. And, and that's hard. That, that is very hard. And it's very messy. And in democracies, sometimes it's very unfair because crises happen at times that we don't know. That's what makes them crises. And therefore, we've got to be vigilant. I tell my students, go vote. Whatever happens, go vote, because that does make a difference. Finally, the implications for COVID-19. There's a lockdown fatigue. And that is a problem if this uh, issue continues. Uh, will it turn out to be like sort of the, the flu, sort of, you know, seasonal? Maybe. I hope so. I hope it disappears. My motto is die, COVID, die. Well, maybe we'll not die. Uh, maybe we'll be seasonal, uh, but we will uh, be unlikely. We'll be very unlikely to see uh, another lockdown the way we did a general lockdown. Um, the state has grown big, and that's that's an issue. That's a huge issue in that because it was a very um, uh, crisis uh, situation, the state took on responsibilities that it, we wouldn't otherwise give the state these, this authority. We need to now take it back. And it has been very costly. So we're going to have to pay for all of this stuff. And we need to be mindful of who's going to pay for it all. Finally, human and civil rights. I mean, part of the issue of emergencies is the government sort of gets to do things to tell us what to do in ways that um, infringe upon civil liberties and our civil rights. Um, will they sort of scale back and will we go back to sort of the normal and what will the new normal uh, be? Or should we now start to be thinking about, you know, essentially a bigger role for the government if it ends up that um, COVID uh, will be with us for, for a long time or the next pandemic, whatever it may be, whenever it, it may happen. Um, these are all thoughts that um, I thought you would uh, be um, interested in thinking about. Gracias. And <laughs> I'm looking forward to your comments and questions. Thanks a lot, Nico. Thanks a lot. Go ahead, Mariana. Perfect, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, for the invitation, Alejandro and, and Professor Jarez for your presentation. I will read from my notes uh, because I made like I, I use um, specific language that I do want to reproduce properly. Um, so uh, in his presentation, Professor Zahariadis anal analyzes the COVID-19 pandemic through the lens of the MSF framework. Um, this is a challenge because it's an ongoing uh, crisis that is still happening, as you mentioned before. Um, so my points are not so much aimed at criticizing, but rather at like fleshing out, shedding light on problematic aspects that might come applying this framework to this specific pandemic. Um, so first of all, I have two to uh, at least like two comments. And uh, then I have like further follow-ups, whatever, but we can like wanna open the space for everyone to ask, actually ask questions. And I will read the questions that are uh, on the chat already once uh, Professor Zaharia is replies to my uh, comments. So write them there if you want me to read them later. Um, so my first concern, my first concern is with the policy window, the idea of policy window. Policy entrepreneurs sometimes have uh, very clear policy windows. They speculate about them. They work with them. Um, specifically in democratic countries where governments change or rotate, you know that there's a framework with which you have to work. So in the case of the COVID-19 pandemic, where uh, is it common to hear that this will come either endemic or um, that it will be seasonal. There are still like so many options open about what will happen in the future. How do we determine a policy window? How do we apply? How well do we mark the limits of a policy window in this case, as we are still in the crisis? Um, are there many policy windows coexisting? 
or just one with ebbs and flows. Uh, if the, this pandemic is sometimes seen as never ending, should we reframe the concept of a policy window for this specific case? So that's like my, <laughs> my general one, my, one of my, my first comment. And my second one is connected to something that I work, uh, which is emotional, the emotional aspect of public policy. Uh, I do it so in the Asian world, and I know that you have written several papers about it. So I'm interested in how you will, <laughs> how you will frame this. So um, I'm, I really like your concept of emotional endowment, and I was wondering um, how do you apply the idea of emotional endowment to a specific crisis in the COVID crisis and what we're talking today. Specifically with the case of fear, which I, I think you're very much familiarized. How do you think that fear has um, shaped the landscape of uh, policy building? Specifically, low trust and how we have seen that low trust in the government with fear, combined with fear, usually gives this sort of like a suspension of judgment. At least what we, at least what I've experienced in Argentina, or at least like looking, reading, because I'm in New York based, but reading what happened in Argentina, is that even though there was a low trust in the government, the fear was so high that people suspended judgment for at least like the first month and really were paying attention to what the leadership was saying. So I felt, and there's still not, not many papers written about it, but I felt that actually fear worked as this unifying factor and as a trust building device. Do you think that this is common and common? There's a trend? No, I want to like I, I want to open up for um, those comments specifically with emotional endowment. Um, so those are my two questions, and um, uh, yeah, I'm eager to hear about your responses. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Very interesting questions. Let me quickly respond to them so that we can get to some of the questions that are in the chat and any others that, that people uh, may wish to, uh, uh, to raise. Um, you raised two questions um, that are very interesting. Let me sort of talk about policy windows first, then I'll get to the fear um, issue. Um, <clears throat> you have different types of windows. You have predictable and unpredictable windows. And that's very important to make the differentiation because some peer, some windows are predictable in the sense that they're part of the institutional milieu, for example, uh, elections. Um, at least in the US, they're, they're very predictable. You know exactly when it's going to happen. So you have a very clear idea of when it's going to ap uh, open and when it's going to close. The key issue, of course, is the unpredictable ones. Uh, where you don't know what it happens. Now, remember that just like problems, there's a perceptual element. You know, what you consider to be a window of opportunity, somebody else may not. And, and therefore, I understand that that, that that involves a subjective judgment um, in that, you know, my opportunity may not necessarily be your opportunity. Um, and therefore, um, trying to decide how long they last is, is a tricky situation. Um, the concept of a policy window was, was developed primarily to enable, as an analytical device, to enable people to uh, determine context because the whole idea behind the multiple streams uh, framework is the choice is to a very large extent contextual. It happens because of what other things are happening at the same time. Um, so um, determining the length is not a terribly easy thing to do. And it does take a little bit of I will admit some subjective judgment in the absence of periodicity, meaning that in the absence of a predictable window, so where you know when it closes. Um, nevertheless, they're assumed to be ephemeral. The idea behind uh, the, uh, the, the sort of the short duration is that you don't have all day to do certain things. And it goes to the idea that um, there is a right time to do things, and not a right time. I'm not gonna say a wrong time, but certainly not a right time uh, to do things. 
So when will sort of, you know, looking at the pandemic, uh, since you, you did mention that, you know, okay, we can see that how it opened. I mean, definitely we can see the opening of a window, but do we see the closing of the window? Because it's still an ongoing process. Well, the answer is um, yes and no because it depends really on what you're looking at. If you're looking at, let's say, preventive measures, you're trying, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to look at, and to stay with what I did, you know, COVID responses in different countries, let's say, and you're trying to uh, understand, well, why did they respond this way versus that way? If you're looking only at preventive measures, because that's the only thing, um, you know, I, I'm, I actually do some research on, they're called non-pharmaceutical interventions, masks, shutdown of schools, that sort of stuff. Um, if you're only looking at that, then the window has closed, more or less. Um, because, and in my opinion, it has closed when vaccinations became widely available. Because then the, it created a completely different ball game. The arsenal, that is, of instruments available to governments to deal with the crisis change qualitatively. So one has to somehow make the argument rather than assume that it's still open. Um, so vaccination sort of uh, mark the end of the one window. If you're looking at preventive measures, if you're looking at, you know, we're trying to eradicate, let's say COVID, or we're trying to deal with COVID in a broad sense, no, it hasn't closed yet. Um, but on the other hand, um, if you're looking at vaccinations, the development of new vaccines, more or less it has closed. That's it. The, the vaccines are more or less it. You're making some sort of um, adjustments to them because of the new uh, types that are coming out. But for the most part, these are the vaccines we're going to have. Now it's treatments. That's, that's, that's the new sort of kid on the block. So the answer is the window closes depending on what it is you're trying to say or, or looking at. The other one about fear as an overriding concept, I would urge you to tell us a little bit about the emotional endowment because I don't think your colleagues may know what the emotional endowment is. And then I'll respond to fear. <laughs> So I, I, I was using like uh, basically your concept of like how it trickles down. Yeah, no, no. I was like taking your 2014 like definition. I know, I know. I know. But tell the, the rest of them, tell the rest of them, because I don't think they know. Oh, okay. No, I, I, I don't know. I don't think they do. Um, so basically, I from what I've read, this was, it's basically the, um, the, uh, the, trickle down the trickling down of emotions and how that affects public policy specifically what i thought it was super interesting is that how when you're like devising public policy you try to map empathically what uh the mood of the um the population is and how that affects your public policy building strategies that's what i but of course is your definition so perhaps i <laughs> No, I, I want to hear what other people say or think about uh, stuff that I write about, by all means. Uh, yeah, the idea behind it is emotional endowment is that emotions like um, sort of cognition uh, have inertia. They stay with us. Uh, for a while, and once they uh, um, they they are primed, they they are aroused in, in ourselves. Uh, they linger, they linger on, and they color the way that we see um, things. And so, different emotions—that's that's the whole concept. Different emotions uh, prompt different responses. And so you have, uh, and, and, and that we know from research in psychology, and I essentially took the same idea and threw it into public policy, see how it works. Uh, it's, it's a leap of faith. Uh, I agree, much more difficult to establish than if you put some people in a lab and sort of ask them questions and figure it out. But, you know, it, it worked out uh, reasonably well. I'm glad uh, Mariana found it uh, useful and hopefully um, it will work out for your uh, research as well. Now, um, does is fear sort of an all sort of um, 
bringing us together concept? Um, the answer is yes, is everybody experiencing sort of the same thing at the same time, which you're absolutely right. Everybody, it wasn't just in Argentina, everywhere. Uh, we were scared stiff about what was happening because it was the unknown. We had no idea what this thing was about. It seemed to be deadly. We had no idea who was dying, why they were dying, et cetera. It was certainly misdiagnosed, absolutely the, the case, at least initially and for a long time um, uh, until we had a much better understanding of what was going on. Um, but is it trust building in terms of public policy? The answer is absolutely not. Um, what is trust building is the feedback loop. That is fear prompts a response on the part of the people because of the uncertainty and the emotion that, that it, uh, it creates to look to government to do something. If government appears as if they're doing something right, they will be judged by it. And therefore, if they seem to be handling it relatively well, then yes, it does build trust. We saw, I saw that in Greece, where you had, I mean, the Greeks, for better or for worse, we are terrible when it comes to trusting our government. I mean, we, we hate our government. We expect a whole lot of it, yes, of course, all the time, but we absolutely hate it at the same time. And it was the very first time where you saw actually people complying with what the government was telling them. And it was really, really difficult stuff to do. You have to wear a mask, you have to do this, you have to do that. Uh, Greeks are like herding cats. It, it just doesn't happen. But it did in this particular case. And you're right, it was fear and the unknown. But the trust came when the government appeared as if it was in control of the situation. And therefore was the feedback that enabled it to gain the trust. And that trust, so that uh, you know, um, has actually gone down in recent years. So in recent months, I should say, partly because the government messed up. I mean, it's made many mistakes. So not everything was, was initially was all right, not, not since. And they've made mistakes and they're paying for it at the polls. So it's the feedback that created um, the trust, not the fear itself. Thank you very, very much for your answer. Super interesting. Uh, Giselle, is this a follow-up? No, I, I, want, I wanted to ask a question, if it's possible. Ah. Okay, perfect. I will. Can I first read the one on the chat? So yes. I respect yes. the order. Yes. I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> so no, okay. uh, Marcela Cifarelli asked, do you believe that the COVID crisis brings greater mistrust in developed countries towards the state? Um, the answer is the, the sort of the easy answer is probably not. The more important answer is... Um, you got to have nuance in in what the the implications are. Uh, in some countries, it brought trust, and we just talked about a place like Greece, where actually trust the government has gone up. Now it may be temporary, that I don't know, but at least for for now it has because the government appears as if it has done better than everybody expected it uh, to do. And that's to their credit, by all means, uh, credit where credit is due. In other places, uh, the government uh, appeared to be not doing what it should have done. Again, the U.S. is a good example, at least initially, and even President Biden, you have probably realized by now, um, I'm far more partial to him than I am to President Trump. Um, they've made mistakes. They make huge mistakes. And uh, that has bred distrust that already existed in the country. It simply reinforced it. Um, uh, 
So uh, I think overall, if, if there is sort of on, on average, what do I think? I think it has actually increased the levels of trust rather than decreased because the fear of uncertainty has gone up and we cannot deal with it on our own. So the only way to deal with it is collectively and the state is the only one that has the power and the legitimacy to deal with it collectively, this, this kind of problem collectively. Perfect, you said? Uh, hi, a uh, very interesting uh, research. Uh, what I want to ask is if any of the cases have considered uh, cases of countries led li by women. I mean, there is a recent study in Brazil, for example, that uh, found that uh, were, I've been mean, researching about cases of municipalities. They found that municipalities led by women uh, have like a better response to the COVID uh, crisis. I mean, so as you have included the, the, the topic about leadership, if there is a there is a an issue about female leadership and how is uh, which are the characteristics of the female leadership uh, as a as a case, I mean in any of the countries that you have uh, researched, if there if there is any any found about that. This is this is one of one of the questions, and the other thing is that talking about the multi, multiple I mean policy uh, streams, I mean and talking about especially the the pro problem stream, how to deal with this problem stream, uh, not only with COVID but also for example in our countries the natural risk disaster management is like an, a huge issue, no? I mean I think it's an issue for most of the. Uh, Latin American countries, also some some uh, uh, countries in North America and also Southeast Asia, for example, uh, countries. But it seems that we don't work too much, or there is there, there are a lot of uh, a lot of challenges, uh, including in the agenda, uh, policies related with uh, preventing or uh, managing a, a crisis or risk. Uh, disaster uh, hazards. Um, so, um, I mean, how, how, to, how to include in the, in the agenda, how, how to uh, not, not uh, I mean, it, it seems like the pandemic is gonna pass at some point. It, uh, we don't know because there are, there are news that China has like a new virus, but uh, we don't know whether it, like a new virus is coming, but it seems that even though it's a virus or it's a natural disaster uh, uh, event, uh, we need we need to, to include in our in the public policy uh, issues related with managing crisis. I mean, like a policy public policy crisis uh, management or prevention, but it seems that it it doesn't. I mean. Uh, it is not like like easy to 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 this topic uh, enter into the problem stream. I mean, they uh, and also I have found, for example, that many of our countries, for example, Latin America, have public policies to to manage, for example, natural disasters. And it seems that in the in the like in the law, no, in the regulation, it seems that everything is working well. But then the pandemic comes, and all of us we don't work too well. So how to problematize perhaps, is, is, is it a problem of problematization? Is it a problem of, uh, of a bad problematization? Uh, is it a problem uh, of uh, public policies that do not take a, a, into account uh, participation or, or the voices of the people? I mean, this is, this is my concern. Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you for raising two very um, interesting issues just to, um respond to the first one because it's a little easier to respond. Uh, the answer is no. We have not looked into uh, gender um, um, issues and how they help us um, uh, address uh, the, the response of uh, different countries. We only looked at the national level and that does make a difference, I understand. When you're going into subnational, that is local levels, then the problem becomes how much is the, the powers or the authority of the local person versus sort of the regional or the national person, you know, who gets to make the decisions, et cetera. And you've got to be very careful to compare apples to apples. 
Now, in this is in this specific situation, and um, this is part of a book that came out in uh, in April. What what I uh, talked to you about it came out in April uh, on trust and and COVID uh, and policy styles. I mean, it was uh, it was not about MSF, although it was related to some of that stuff. And so uh, we looked at 10, 11 countries. Um, and only one of them had a woman a prime minister at the time. Now more do, but we only looked at sort of a very limited uh, time frame, uh, essentially before vaccines became uh, available. Um, and it was just one New Zealand. I did not want to draw inferences just from a sample of one. Maybe New Zealand is a, an outlier, an exception. I mean, I, I have no idea. Part of the problem with all of this stuff is unless you have a very um, diverse sample of, of countries with you know, a fair number of women, so you can have some variance uh, uh, in the dependent variable, it becomes very difficult to, to try to figure out, not, not a dependent, the independent variable, some, some, some difference. Um, it becomes very difficult uh, to draw conclusions about gender and whether gender makes a difference in, in this case or not. So I, I don't wanna speculate because I, I don't know. I don't know whether uh, whether it made any difference or not. Now, in terms of the other issue that, that you raised, um, in my opinion, the, you've got to look at this disaster management stuff in two ways. One of them is sort of the response, which is the way that I looked at it. The other one is the resilience uh, part of it, uh, where you build capacity to deal with future responses. Part of the problem with getting issues such as resilience on the public agenda, and more importantly, getting them to be enacted by the government, and even more importantly, getting them to be implemented, because as we all know, uh, laws are just so that they stay on the books so that no, nobody pays attention to them. Um, so in order to, to build that capacity, um, you gotta have a, usually um, either a very wise legislature and leadership, which is highly unlikely, or you have to have a huge aftermath. That is the aftermath of a disaster needs to be such so that people say, okay, no more because this is not going to, uh, go over well next time. So you build that capacity and resilience because essentially what, what you're asking people to do is um, waste money because you're, you're storing idle resources for a crisis that may occur at some point that you don't know. You're bearing the cost as a policymaker. You got to think about it politically as a politician. You're bearing the cost now, but whoever's going to reap the benefit may be 10 years from now, perhaps your opponent. And that does not make you happy, of course. Um, so it's very difficult to do so. There's a good um, article in many years ago. Uh, I think in 2003, something like that. The crisis reform dilemma. Uh, if if you do with with if you deal with disaster management, you you know all about that. Um, and and I think it's a very real problem. Now, how do you get um, sort of all of these um, all of these lessons? You you got to draw these you know the right lessons. Uh, from these disasters and build them into your policy capacity, but also be able to implement it. Um, that takes sustained effort. And again, uh, leadership is, in my opinion, the only way to do it. Even drawing the right lessons. Imagine, you know, the most horrible disasters, such as the pandemic, of 2020 to 2022. I mean, more than 6 million people dead, at least in my mind, this day and age, that's a lot of people. That's 6 million more than should have been. Um, the only, and, and I believe, that's my own personal belief, I will disavow any public knowledge of it, only privately. Um, uh, my personal belief is that, no, we haven't learned from it. 
uh, very few countries will actually draw the right kind of lessons, put in the resources that probably need to be put in in order to deal with future pandemics that are, you know, or maybe COVID next year, I don't know, that, that are, will surely come, partly because people want to go back to normal. And going back to normal means you don't want to deal with these issues because that's what was normal. You have other priorities. And given sort of the, the scarcity of resources, yeah, you're going to put your money back to what your population demands that you do and not into some future disaster that may or may not happen. That's the unfortunate reality, I think, of things. I Thank hope you. I'm wrong. Please prove me wrong in Argentina, please. <laughs> I have my faith in you because I know it's not going to happen in the U.S. Certainly it's not happening in Greece. I can tell you that. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. I think you actually responded the last question that we had on the chat by Annabel. So thanks, it's closed perfectly um, because you, we don't wanna go over the time. We wanna be respectful of everyone's schedules. So I will leave to Alejandro to close. So Nico, thank you very much for your exposition. It was great for us and thanks a lot. Nico, if you can send uh, your PowerPoint uh, to transcript your conference, please. I thought I sent you the yeah. PowerPoint. I made it available on Google Drive because I cannot email it. It's too big. Uh, don't you worry. Don't if you worry. can open, if you can open the Google Drive yes. uh, that I sent you, that's that's a PowerPoint. It's not as hip as this yes. one that was dramatic with black and red. It's <laughs> scarier. The other don't one worry. is less scary. Don't worry. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Nico. Thanks a lot. Mariana Noé, thanks a lot, Giselle. Thanks a lot to all our public and audience. Uh, it's all. Uh, we are done. Uh, it's a pleasure much. to have yeah. you here. Thank See you. Me. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, maybe sometime next time in uh, Buenos Aires. Who knows? Yes. Okay. Yes, Bye. please. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. We'll Thank you, you very much. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Yes.